بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم the name of Allah the beneficent the most merciful I'd like to welcome you dear viewers to our program contemporary issues assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh may Allah's peace and blessings be on each and every one of you in this segment of our program we're going to be looking at some dietary considerations the dietary laws in Islam or some aspects of these dietary laws. In our previous program, we looked at alcohol and its prohibition. In this program, we'll be looking at the issue of pork. Uh, Muslims are known not to eat pork, so are Jews. So, prohibition on pork is not something which Islam, in the sense that Prophet Muhammad brought Islam, that peace and blessings be upon him, it was not introduced by that final message of Islam. It was introduced by earlier prophets. Prophet Moses, who was a prophet also of Islam, though he's known as a Jewish prophet or a prophet of the Jews. Really, from Islamic perspective, he was a prophet of Islam. It was in his legal system. And no doubt it was there from the beginning of time. When human beings were on this earth and when the pigs were around. Allah prohibited the eating of the pigs for a reason. For protection of the human being from harm. Now, some people in trying to look at the prohibition, try to look at it from this reasoning, logical kind of perspective, and they said, well, if we look at it, you know, from the perspective of the rate of decomposition of pork and others, other meats, you find that if you take a pound of pork and a pound of beef, a pound of goat, sheep, cow, and leave it, that pork will, will decompose most rapidly. It will go bad, get rotten very, very quickly, much faster than that of beef, etc. So they said that probably the ancient people observed this. I mean, they know that a person, you know, when meat goes bad, you know, you can eat this, you get certain illness, like botulism and things like this, you can get illness from eating tainted meat. So they said people probably of the past observed this, and because of that, they prohibited pork. However, such explanations don't really hold water. This is not the basis why it was prohibited. Well, there may be an aspect in that sense that, you know, Muslims are spared the possible harm that may come from quick decomposing meat. However, we believe as Muslims that pork contains harm to human beings. Whether we discover this harm, don't discover the harm. We believe there's harm because God is not acting arbitrarily, prohibiting things just to make life difficult for people. No. This is not the way of God. The way of God is a wise and reasoning, a reasonable way. He prohibits things which are harmful and he permits things which are not. And he obliges things which are beneficial. Now, when we look at pork, it has been identified by the, once they developed the microscope, etc. They were able to identify that pork was the main cause or source of trichnosis, the disease trichnosis, but caused by a worm known, known as Trichinella spiratis. And this is found primarily in pigs. Humans usually acquire the infection by eating encysted larvae in raw or undercooked pork or products. Of course, what do we define as undercooked? Really, it, me it meant under 170 degrees Fahrenheit. Before, it was less. Now, the current recommended temperature is 77 degrees Celsius or 170 degrees Fahrenheit in order to kill the trichinella worms. So meat had to be cooked at a very high temperature. Get it? Most people don't have ovens that cook at this type of temperatures. Now, the harm which comes from trichinosis, you know, we're saying that actually even in America till today, there are over 150,000 cases of people 
you know, suffering from trichinosis. Now, when the larvae of the worm is released into the system, it is possible for people who are treated to die from it within two to three weeks. In the overwhelming infections, more often, it occurs between four to eight weeks. There are major complications such as cardiac failure or pneumonia. This is when people usually die from it. Now, this tapeworm, of course, this pork worm, is something which can be killed by high temperature cooking. So the point rises then, so what? If we can cook it high, will you now eat the pork? No, we still won't. Because the harm from it may, may be, not, it's not to say this is the only harm. I mean, the, the, the fat content of pork is much higher than any other meat. People who have problems with clogging arteries, etc., are encouraged not to eat pork. But there's another factor which has been suggested that when we look at the general permiss permissibility which is set in Islam for animals which may be eaten, we find that Islam prohibits the eating of the carnivores, the flesh eaters, the lions, the tigers, the eagles, the hawks, the alligators, etc., etc. And it permits the herbivores, the plant eaters, the cows, the sheep, the chicken, the pigeons, so on. So the general distinction made between carnivores and herbivores. Why? The pig is a carnivore. It'll eat, it's an omnivore actually, it eats both herbal uh, sources from herbal sources as well as from flesh sources. Now, it may be that the nature of the animal is conveyed in its meat. The nature of the carnivore is there in its flesh, in its genes. When a tiger catches its prey, if we watch on National Geographic or, you know, the educational program, you see how a tiger or a lion hunts a deer or whatever, antelope or zebra, how it tears it apart, it seems very vicious, etc. But that's just how it is. If we observe, on the other hand, the goats and the sheep and the cows who eat their grass and they just chew their cud, they seem to be very mild and timid kind of animals. Perhaps this prohibition has to do with this thing of the nature, because we're building up our systems with what we eat. And, you know, as some people have said in the past, well-known nutritionists in, in Germany, and that's what said, you are what you eat. Now, if we look at the pig and how it eats, it lives in very squalid and nasty circumstances. Pig farms are the most horrible smelling areas on the face of this earth. You know, the, the smell from pig farms, you know, raise court problems. People who set up pig farms, you know, and, and people are living downwind of the pig farms, they end up raising cases in the courts to try to shut these places down because they're intolerable. And the nature of the pig remains in its genes, just as the nature of the carnivore is in its genes in general. The tiger is a tiger. You read of cases where people raise tigers as pets. But sometime along the line, the tiger scratches their owners or bites their owners. Or the lion tamer in the circus. The, the highlight of the circus performance is when the lion tamer he gets the lions up on the on the podiums and the lion opens its mouth or he opens the lion's mouth and he puts his head in the lion's mouth. Every year, a lion decides to close his mouth and take off the head. That's why lion trainers get good pay. It's very hazardous. Why did the lion do that? This trainer had been training the lion when it was a child, from it was a cub, first born. Yet at some point in its life, it decides to go against the trainer. Why? It's the nature, the nature of the lion. So, 
uh, it has been concluded that, you know, perhaps the prohibition has to do with the nature of the animal itself. And Islam prohibits the eating of pork. No matter how it is served, no matter how it is raised, it is prohibited across the board. Pork and the pork products. This is why for Muslims, who are very careful about what we eat. You know, there are a lot of products which are produced in the West. The breads, etc., where they use lard, which is from pork. You know, even gelatin, which is used in the, in the capsules of, of uh, many drugs produced in the West. You know, if we're not careful, they take this from pork sources. So, from an Islamic perspective, Muslims avoid pork and its products. The other point which we'd like to discuss in this segment of the program is that of tobacco. The tobacco industry, which is now under attack. Before it attacked, now it is under attack. Huge fines have been levied against some of these big tobacco companies for the harm that they've done in people's lives. The Marlboro Man, who we used to see all the time in, you know, in the Time magazines, etc., you would see him riding off into the sunset with a rugged cowboy hat, that Marlboro skirt in his mouth. He died a few years back, and his wife is suing the Marlboro Company for his death. So, uh, it has been concluded that, you know, perhaps the prohibition has to do with the nature of the animal itself. And Islam prohibits the eating of pork. No matter how it is served, no matter how it is raised, it is prohibited across the board. Pork and the pork products. This is why for Muslims, we're very careful about what we eat. You know, there are a lot of products which are produced in the West. The breads, etc., where they use lard from pork. You know, even gelatin, which is used in the capsules of, of uh, many drugs produced in the West. You know, if we're not careful, they take this from pork sources. So, from an Islamic perspective, Muslims avoid pork and its products. The other point which we'd like to discuss in this segment of the program is that of tobacco. The tobacco industry, which is now under attack. Before it attacked, now it is under attack. Huge fines have been levied against some of these big tobacco companies for the harm that they've done in people's lives. The Marlboro Man, who we used to see all the time in, you know, in the Time magazines, etc., you would see him riding off into the sunset with his rugged cowboy hat, that Marlboro cigarette in his mouth. He died a few years back, and his wife is suing the Marlboro Company for his death. The point is that some people, when dealing with the issue of uh, tobacco, they raise this point saying, well, it's, it's makru, it's just disliked. You know? Why do you want to say that it is haram? It's just disliked. The fact of the matter is that, yes, when in the 17th century tobacco first came to the Ottoman Empire, the scholars had to deal with it, had to find some kind of ruling. What do we do with it? And they looked at its harm. The only thing they could find is it produced bad breath. And when they went back into the Shia, to the laws of the Quran and the Sunnah, the way of the statements of the Prophet, they found that the Prophet ﷺ had said, whoever eats any of this offensive plant, garlic, should not come to the mosque. And the people had said, it's forbidden. It has been forbidden. The Prophet ﷺ said, oh people, I cannot forbid what Allah has made lawful, but the plant has an odor which I dislike. And of course, it is harmful for those people who are praying in the mosque. When you pray beside somebody who is eating raw garlic, you know, he breathes on you. He ends the prayer saying, Salaamu Alaikum Wa Rahmatullah. I mean, of course, it's something very painful. So Islam says you eat garlic, raw garlic, onions, pray at home better. Yes, you lose out on some blessings of prayer and congregation in the mosque, but better you do that and protect the rest of the society. Now, that was the observation made back in the 17th century. 17th century. Some 400 years ago. 
In 1979, the Surgeon General of the United States of America announced that smoking causes cancer. It had been proven without a shadow of a doubt to cause cancer. Now, this had been something which had been the subject of a debate amongst in the medical profession for a number of years. Scientists who were in the pay of the tobacco companies were arguing, oh, it has not been conclusively proven, we're not sure, we don't know. While other doctors, medical profession people, way back in the 60s were saying, hey, it looks like this thing causes cancer. But the evidence was not all correlated, it was not all gathered. You know, people had gotten heavily into smoking from way back in the 50s, 40s, and now you had generations, people now were dying. And cancer was a big factor. So it wasn't really until 1979 that the evidence became so overwhelming that Cigarette companies were now forced to place on the bottom of their packages hazardous to health, cancer causing, etc., etc., etc. Warnings. Not by choice. They were not doing this by choice. They were doing it to warn because the government was forcing them to. So smoking of cigarettes went on a decline in the West. Once we know that it causes death, then the Islamic law regarding it has to change. We go back into the Sharia, we find Allah saying, وَلَا تَقْتُلُوا أَنفُسَكُمْ إِنَّ اللَّهَ كَانَ بِكُمْ رَحِيمًا This is in Surah Nisa, the fourth chapter. We also find in Surah Al-Baqarah, second chapter, verse 195, وَلَا تُلْقُوا بِأَعْدِكُمْ لَتَهْلُكَ That is, do not throw yourselves into destruction with your own hands. So, we find here, there's this, is prohibiting this. Prophet Muhammad, may God's peace be upon him, also said, whoever kills himself with a knife will be in hell forever stabbing himself. And whoever drinks poison and kills himself will be eternally in the hellfire killing himself that way. And whoever kills himself by falling off a mountain, jumping off a mountain, will forever jump off a mountain in the hellfire. So, Suicide, in, from Islamic perspective, is considered to be haram. When a person smokes, knowing that it can cause cancer, this is an act of suicide. This is an act of suicide. From Islamic perspective, this is haram. Not only does it kill the individual, it kills others around. Of course, Islam also forbids the harming of others. La darar wa la dirar. Do not harm yourselves or harm others. And this, what they call this secondary smoke, the smoke which is coming from the cigarettes, the smoker, he's got a filter, filtering it out somewhat, but the people who are around him are being exposed to the direct smoke. They are also suffering, many people dying from it. Now, people may argue, but you know, when I take a smoke, I'm not thinking about killing myself, but hey, if you were to take poison, small amounts of poison, you know, teaspoonful every day because you like the taste. But you know it's poison. It will kill you. And after six months or after a year, you finally drop over dead. What do we say? You killed yourself. We don't say, you know, it just happens. His intention wasn't to kill himself. No, he killed himself. Other people argue that, hey, the oldest person in the world was in China, a woman. You know, she used to smoke a cigar every day. She didn't die from cancer. So, not everybody who smokes gets it. The point is that when we apply a law, we apply it according to the generality, the exceptions. Yes, every year you will find cases of people falling from airplanes. They jump off their parachute, they pull the ripcord, it doesn't open. People, this is a sport people are involved in. Jumping out of airplanes, pulling ripcords of parachutes to go floating down to earth. Not a necessity, but just a lot of fun. Well, Every year, some people pull the ripcord and no parachute comes out and they fall. And there are cases, every year, one person or so falls 40,000 feet, 20,000 feet, whatever. And they live. You see pictures of them sitting in a wheelchair, you know, thumbs up. They made it. Big smile on their face. They may have broken so many bones in their bodies, maybe paralyzed or whatever, but you see they're happy. They survive. It happens. So now, we asked the smoker who says, well, not everybody who smokes dies. We said, okay, you as a smoker. Now, if you're jumping out of an airplane, are you going to take a parachute or not? 
Take a parachute. Why? Why take the parachute? We know some people fall 40,000 feet and live. No. When you jump, you're going to take your parachute. Why? Because you don't judge and you don't make a decision according to the minority of cases, the exceptions. You make a decision based on the general rule that if you fall 40,000 feet, they will have to scrape you up and put you in the grave. You're not going to survive it. You don't base your action on the exception. So in the same way, you don't base it in that case, you don't base it in, in smoking too. Smoking is fairly haram and forbidden in Islam. It involves suicide, it involves intoxication, it involves addiction, it involves so many things. The harm which comes to it to the individual and to the people around him is so great, we should have no hesitation in realizing that this is prohibited in Islam. With that, dear viewers, I'd like to thank you for being with us in this segment of our program where we have looked at issues of smoking as well as the issue of pork. Why do Muslims not eat pork? Ultimately, God forbade it. Muslims should not be smoking because God has forbidden harming ourselves and harming others. And there is wisdom behind the law, the legal system of Islam. It is not arbitrary. God prohibits what is harmful. He permits what is beneficial. With that, dear viewers, I hope to see you in the next programs. You know, we will continue to look at different issues. Coming up, we have the issue of animal slaughter. Why do Muslims cut the necks of animals? Is it really causing suffering, undue and unnecessary suffering to the animals? Is there a better way? With that, I close our program now. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.